Okay, this is Eli Opaltree starting the Snow King. Okay, so now we're finally to our speaker, Michael Jaras. And uh, I'm really excited to have him here. I've heard about the Whatcom Bee Help Consulting Service for a long time. And he admits to having about 20 hives annually, trying to keep it down, I'm sure, because it expands to 50 before you know it if you don't watch. But you learn what your limitation is, right, after a while. And and Michael really believes in building bee community and has been doing classes. I think this school of hands-on beekeeping type thing, you have to explain that, okay, Michael? And working on local strains, kind of carniolan-ish. So explain some about the carniolan. Everybody here would be really interested in hearing about that. And not constantly bringing up Italifornian bees. People who've taken my classes have heard me call them the ones that come up from the South, the Italifornian bees, <laughs> because they had a lot of Italian heritage because it worked so well for bees that would brood up in the spring, produce lots of honey, be fairly docile. And I haven't found they're the best ones in this area. So I think I'd better turn it over to Michael. Let me stop share. Let's see if we can get back to Michael's share. Ready, Michael? I'm here. Okay, so if you hit share screen, And after Michael speaks, then we'll go on and we can talk as long. You know me. It, those of you who know me, I will talk all night long about bees. Fair. Well, um, let me just say I'm pleased to be here. Um, I uh, didn't realize that Eli was in Maltby. And I have a friend in Maltby, maybe you know, uh, Matthew Waddington. Uh, I think he's not a member of any bee club, but he's quite a beekeeper. So... Just thought I'd throw that out. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I've been keeping bees for, this is my 16th season. And uh, I have, um, Ellie said 20, which was generous, but I actually have uh, at the moment 14, I think. And I generally try to overwinter about a dozen hives. And with a dozen hives, that allows me to make um, a good number of splits in the spring and to make really uh, uh, healthy, effective queens in the summer. Because, of course, you need a great density of bees to make good queens. And um, it seems that 10 or 12 hives is kind of the bare minimum. Most people who make queens have many, many, many more hives than that. Um, and I like to do things on a small scale, and it is still technically a hobby for me, so I don't want to let things get out of hand. Um, I always uh, like to wave my flag a little bit uh, about my what I consider a good, uh, my kind of a major achievement in that I bought bees the first year I started beekeeping in 2000 a package from the local distributor. And that's the last time I ever bought a bee of any kind. Um, I've always uh, made my own queens and bees and in the beginning caught a few swarms. Uh, and now I, I don't touch swarms because I'm breeding bees for certain characteristics. So um, I, uh, my, my long-term goal is to create or at least to collaborate with other beekeepers to create a bee that's uniquely suited to our conditions on Bellingham Bay here in Whatcom County. Um, and I'm making some strides towards that goal um, with my, my own bees. And gradually um, in, through selling newts and through uh, uh, queen rearing in the summer, spreading my bees or my, my strain of bees out into the county. And people have had pretty good luck with them. So um, that, that, that's a project in, the, in progress. Um, my, my other goals in beekeeping are to be sustainable, at least sustainable for bees, so that I'm responsible for producing all my bees um, I, I do, I should uh, say here that I do occasionally bring in 
um, bees that I admire from other beekeepers in the county. And uh, that's to uh, limit inbreeding in, in my own strain of bees and uh, to encourage genetic diversity in my, uh, my bees. Um, a, a second, of course, you can't really be sustainable for equipment or medications or feed. That's beyond the capability of any beekeeper that I know. But being sustainable for bees is, is, is a doable thing, even for a small, a relatively small beekeeper. Um, another big goal is to inhibit swarming. Of course, swarming used to be encouraged by beekeepers to increase their numbers. And, um, but today we live in the rural world and swarming is uh, generally ends up producing mite bombs. And uh, because most, most swarms are not caught unless you're sitting in a chair in front of your hives, uh, swarms are there and they're gone and uh, very few of them are caught. Maybe somebody else catches your swarm, but generally you don't. And you're lucky if you do. Um, so I, um, I have gone for quite a few years without allowing any swarms. Um, once in a while, a year comes by and I, I um, get distracted or something, or I read my hive logs wrong and I allow a swarm. But most years, um, this year also, I haven't allowed any swarms. And the only, um, the only bee, beekeeping activity that I'm aware of in, within flying distance of my hives are folks who have my bees and who have taken my classes and who kind of do beekeeping my way, or at least ask me. Um, for advice occasionally. So I don't have to deal with uh, commercial beekeepers or uh, pollinators or things like that. Uh, so uh, one, tonight I'm gonna to talk about the Snellgrove board. And the Snellgrove board is a way of, a very, very elementary way of preventing swarms and also requeening your hive annually if you want, and also um, allowing for increase if you want to do that. You don't have to take the new hive that's created in this process. Um, you can just re, you know, re, replace your, your old queen, uh, but the option is there. Um, and I've used this system for about uh, over 10 years now. I think the first year I was 2010. Um, and I'll just tell you very briefly about the, the origins of this, this method. Um, L.E. Snellgrove was a British beekeeper of some renown um, in the 20th century. And he was active from the 1930s through the 1950s. He at one time was the president of the British Beekeepers Association. And uh, he was uh, seen as the beekeeper's beekeeper and a very inventive uh, one at that and operating in, in southeastern England, which has a climate uh, not too different from uh, ours. They're on, a, you know, on, the, on the English Channel and uh, weather conditions are really not that different from what we have here. And um, his, his great claim to fame, even to this day, at least amongst beekeepers, is this method of preventing swarms based on his invention, the Snellgrove board, which is a very simple piece of equipment, not too different from an ordinary uh, Eek or spacer, and in a in a Langstroth Langstroth hive stack, um, and he he came up with this idea during the early 30s in England, um, 
So it was in the middle of the depression. Uh, he was working uh, with beekeepers who had very, very little space. So we, many of us have generous amounts of space to keep bees in, but in, in a, a more densely populated country uh, like Southern England, that's not the case. And for many of us too, like I, I'm very limited in the, in the space that I have to keep bees. Um, I, I don't keep bees at home. I keep them uh, in borrowed locations. And uh, so I have to be very conscious about how, how much I can expand the, the hives and various other operations. So, and people had no money to buy equipment at, uh, during the depression. Uh, so he was looking for a way to, that beekeepers could be sustainable, that they could uh, have a reliable honey harvest because um, honey, obviously brings in cash, which was a rare, you know, uh, um, in short supply in those days. So um, a reliable honey harvest. And then of course, um, beekeepers were relatively close together and swarms were even then for different purposes because it was before Varroa, of course, um, but swarms were not uh, appreciated, especially if you kept bees in a residential uh, area in the, a small village. So, um, uh, let's see if I can change the slide here. There we go. Um, so in my own reading, somehow I came across the name Snellgrove and the fact that he had been involved in queen rearing and had published a book about queen, queen rearing, which is actually still in print today. Um, but the main thing I was interested in was his method of controlling swarms. Um, when I first um, learned about Snellgrove, I was still keeping bees at home. And of course I had neighbors very close and I was uh, much less skilled than I am now at preventing swarms. And so this was um, uh, something that caught my eye. And um, it's also something that wasn't, most people I asked about it didn't, weren't aware of it. It wasn't in common use, at least not in North America. Because it is a, it's a, it's a system designed for small, uh, small scale beekeeping, and most of our equipment and methods that we use and we teach are come to us from, to, at least to a large degree, from large scale commercial beekeeping. They're the ones that kind of determine what's what equipment is is made and sold, and uh, many of their methods. Uh, are, are um, cited in books and in classes. But there's a lot of stuff out there that has been used successfully over the years for very small scale beekeepers. And that kind of falls off to the um, out of view. And this is one of those things. So uh, Snellgrove wrote a book and that was first published in 1935 called Swarming Its Control and Prevention. My copy is on, is everybody seeing my screen there? Okay, good. Um, uh, my copy is on the left there, uh, which was the 13th edition. Uh, this book is still in print today, the, the one on the right. Um, my, at the time I became interested, I couldn't find this book anywhere. And I finally found it used in a religious bookstore in Australia. So it took, forever to get it, but I finally did um, and uh, read through it. It's a little bit of a challenge to read because it's in English English from uh, 80 years ago, and it's in beekeepers English English. So a little translation is required, but it's certainly not beyond anything uh, a normal, uh, uh, you know, a, a beekeeper with uh, 
at least minimal training would understand. So it's it's readily available. You can get it on Amazon. It's cheap. Um, you never know. Your local library might have it. My local library does have it because I asked them to get a copy. Um, uh, and then Snobro continued to perfect his method for uh, until the late 50s. So for uh, 25 years or so, he he revised his book and and tweaked the method until it was for his purposes uh, next to perfect. So that's the book. If you're interested, uh, it's it's it. He speaks about why about basic bee biology, swarm swarm and queen biology. Uh, and then he explains why his method uses these principles uh, to be successful. So this is a, a drawing of the original Snellgrove board. You have to imagine that it's a little bit more rectangular and, and fits into the Langstroth uh, hive stack. Um, uh, it was a little bit awkward to use because the, the, the doors that allow bees access which um, you see my um, my pointer here. Okay, good. Um, look, the little plugs that close these openings or entranceways for the bees were easily lost, or you'd have to put a string on them, and they were awkward. So, in the ensuing um, uh, fifty to eighty years, the the equipment was modernized. Um, after um, uh, Snellgrove had left the scene. And this is what a modern Snellgrove board uh, is, looks like. I am not a great woodworker, and I, I, I would prefer to work with bees, not with wood. So I tried to buy one, and I called uh, or contacted all the different suppliers, Man Lake and Data Amps and so on. And nobody knew what the Snellgrove board was. And then, purely by accident, in an email, somebody mentioned a double screen board. And of course, then I was able that they, they recognized that. And they were available, I think, of, as um, one of the smaller bee suppliers that I, I, I got them from originally. My first boards were made by a carpenter friend of mine. And to, these days, you can buy them for 25 bucks from Man Lake. Um, or if you really want good quality, you can see my friend Harold uh, up here, uh, just outside of Bellingham. He built um, a couple dozen snowcrow boards this year for uh, beekeepers in the county, and they're uh, to die for. They're much better quality than what you can buy commercially. And uh, so if you're interested, get in touch with me, and I'll get you in touch with Harold. Uh, Harold also, Harold Ben Ellsberg, uh, is also building me a set of Asian giant hornet traps, high front traps. I kind of stuck my neck out and decided to invest in these. Um, the traps were uh, developed in Japan because the Japanese beekeepers have been dealing with Asian giant hornet for many, many decades. I, I don't actually know. I think they've been dealing with Asian giant hornet as long as there's been commercial beekeepers in Japan. Uh, and they're pretty good at it. They move hives and they, they have uh, hive front traps and uh, several other methods uh, to deal with these critters. I'm not entirely convinced uh, that they were eradicated here. Um, Washington State Department of Agricultural Agricultural did a bang up job locating them and uh, you know organizing the the um, ID tracks that you're some of you are using um, and they did finally manage to um, uh, locate isolate and destroy a, a major uh, nest up near the border the Canadian border. Um, but that said, uh, there have been, with the original sightings on Vancouver Island and multiple sightings 
uh, in Lower Mainland BC and also in Whatcom County. And now uh, this year, I guess there was one found in Snohomish County. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But, um, so the since the AGH operates uh, with many queens per colony, um, I think the chances are pretty good that somewhere in um, the area that there are more nest building. And I don't have any scientific evidence for that. Um, there have been no specimens found yet this year, um, with the exception of the, the dead specimen in Snohomish County. And no one at this point has really said how old that specimen actually is. But um, given my pretty extensive reading about this pest, I decided to um, uh, invest in, in Harold's carpentry and have him build some high front traps. Uh, they are not unlike, they're much larger, of course, than uh, robbing screens. Um, but they're easily attached and detached from the front of a hive. Uh, the bees learn how to uh, access the hive and uh, manage that trap very quickly in a day or two. And um, it remains to be seen. Uh, let me just take a drink of water here. <clears throat> it remains to be seen um, how effective they are here, but they're. Um, they're sold by the beekeeping supplies in Japan, um, and uh, I've had some correspondence that indicates they're effective there. So I guess we'll find out. I ordered 15 uh, from Harold, and he's he's finished. I'm supposed to pick him up tomorrow morning, and uh, <clears throat> so we'll see how that turns out. So. The modern snow growth board uh, dispenses with those little plugs for the entrances and it substitutes a, a little swivel door like this. And in, in subsequent slides, I'll, uh, I'll point out why, how this system works and why it works and what its advantages are. But just for now, we'll take a look at uh, it's how it looks physically. Um, there's uh, on each, of three sides of the board, there are two doors. So there are six doors altogether and uh, three sets. And each set, uh, one door opens on one side of the hive and it's opposite, uh, just below it, opposite, uh, opens to the other side of the, the hive, which would uh, is means that it opens to the um, Langstroth box above and below where the board is placed in the stack. Uh, and if you if you ever decide to do this, um, I did a big promotion this year, and I got um, quite a few beekeepers in Whatcom County to try this, some for the first time. Uh, I've been going out and helping people uh, split their hives in the spring using this method for, um, I think, four years now. Um, my carpenter friend Harold is he's done it for three years in a row with great success and um there there are a few little tweaks that uh if, whether you buy it in the mail or whether you crank it out in your garage shop uh there are a few little tweaks uh one is painting it uh it's always good to paint the outside exposed surface just like you would with most of the keeping equipment and then the bees propolize the doors um, uh, consider quite a bit. And so painting the door, all the surfaces of the, the, the little swivel uh, trapezoid that you see on the screen is highly recommended because propolis soaks into bare wood like murder. And uh, once this board is sandwiched in between heavy hive boxes, opening it once it's uh, sealed with propolis is a real trick. It can be done, but the, the, you don't really need any, any tricks if you paint it 
um, uh, it used to be people would put Vaseline or all different kinds of lubricants on it. And I, I really don't like to expose the bees to anything I'm not absolutely sure of. And I am absolutely sure about latex paint. So painting the, 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 um, the edges on, uh, on all sides and also in the sash that the little door sits in. Um, and letting them uh, completely dry before you reassemble is a helpful thing to do. So Snowgrove's book is maybe at best a quarter inch thick. It's more of a pamphlet than a book. And a lot of it you don't need how to read unless you're, in, you're really interested in beekeeping history. Um, Snowgrove refers to prior methods of swarm prevention, both in uh, Europe and in the United States. He was in correspondence with a lot of uh, kind of semi-famous beekeepers in the United States. And uh, so he talks about all these different things. But the method itself and the explanation of the method is quite short. It's maybe... 15 or 20 pages at most. But if, you, if you're allergic to reading or the, the Snellgrove's um, syntax is, is challenging, uh, you can just go to these two pages, two adjacent pages. And they're like the Betty, Betty Crocker recipe for how to do uh, uh, Snellgrove swarm control. Uh, on the left, of course, is uh, before, during, after pictures. Uh, figure one is a, a regular two box Langstroth hive, maybe uh, what you would have early in the spring. Figure two is uh, uh, the, the, the first part of the setup. Figure three is uh, uh, another progression. And figure four is the, uh, the, the board itself, the snowgrove board is, uh, is in place between uh, A and B. And uh, snowgrove refers, uh, B is your uh, overwintered colony with a queen. And A is a new colony um, that you get as a, uh, as a result of this method. Um, and the basic principle is, uh, which you can read on the right-hand page uh, from beginning to end, uh, the basic principle is isolating um, the elements that are necessary to, for, a high, for a honeybee colony to swarm. So you're taking all the brood in a two-box spring hive, and putting it in the top box and leaving the queen with a tiny, tiny little patch of fruits, maybe ideally something like a half dollar piece or a silver dollar, just enough to make the queen feel at home and uh, kind of keep her happy and operating. And, um, and all the empty brood frames and of course a, a few a few food, food frames on the outside are what end up in the, the bottom colony, B, with the old queen. And she's excluded there, of course. And then you add a super in there because this process takes about um, maybe a month or five weeks. And uh, during that process, there's going to be considerable spring honey flow, and the bottom colony will grow quickly. You're, you, um, you're isolating a queen who's already been laying at top speed, having overwintered and, and built up maybe five to seven frames of brood. So that queen is still laying at full, full blast, and uh, you set her, set her brood clock back to zero. So she's starting from nothing, and but a queen laying that fast will fill up that that bottom box quickly, and uh, there needs to be some place to put the honey. So that's the reason for the the um, the honey super in between these two colonies. And then in the top box, 
um, once the cell growth board is in place below it, um, the, the cell growth board is essentially a double screen board with two screens uh, on either side of a piece of half inch plywood um, or three eighths plywood, and uh, which separates the bees from the bee colony below from the bees in the A colony above. And uh, since we all know that queen pheromone is transmitted as a, a liquid by little bee feet tracking it around the hive, they can't do that because they, 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 they can't make contact with each other um, separated as they are by those two screens. So the colony up in A says, oh, whoa, we're without a queen, let's make one. And they do. Um, sometimes they make, uh, they, they generally make maybe half a dozen queen cells. Sometimes they make it on more than one frame and they go about their merry business um, doing that. And uh, of course, both colonies need to be, have access to forage and um, all the other reasons that bees fly. And we'll come to that in the next couple of slides. So this kind of explains how the, the snow grove uh, trick, I, I refer to it as a trick. Snellgrove referred to it as the method. Um, so the, the little inset um, photograph on the left is unfortunately a different hive than the one on the right, as you can see by the, the different uh, hive box colors, but uh, the principle is the same. Uh, so you've isolated uh, all the brood combs in colony A at the top. That's going to be your new colony, your new queen, uh, perhaps increase in the number of hives you have if you decide to do that. Um, and the cell growth board is in between, and then the old queen and uh, the her growing colony is uh, below it. So with this now grow board in place. Initially, door one uh, is the first door that's that's open. The, the lower colony just enter, enters and exits through its regular entrance like normal. But the top colony is sealed by the cell growth board except for the little doors around its periphery on three sides. So initially door one is open and all the bees from colony A um, use that entrance to mostly leave and go back home down to the lower colony because that's what they know is home. Um, although enough remain for foraging and of course all the nurse bees remain uh, to, to care for the brood. And um, at a certain point, the all brood begins or bees begin to emerge from that brood in colony A and there gets to be too many bees upstairs. So what to do with those? And the old queen in colony B is producing uh, more and more brood, which needs to be cared for. What to do with that? Uh, so you make a valve and uh, you close door one and open door two. Door one communicates with the top box, colony A and door two with colony B at the bottom. The bees don't notice the difference because the doors are so close to each other that they treat them as the same entrance. So in this picture on the left, you can see uh, it's a picture taken just after closing door one. So those bees in the picture are kind of, they know something is afoot, um, but it doesn't take very long before they they take advantage of door two and they go in there and door two of course goes to the lower colony and they reinforce the the um the um the bees in the bottom colony and as bees will do some of them revert to nurse bees and some of them carry on as foragers um and this trick is repeated they're they're the same door set one and two uh, reoccurs again on the opposite side of the hive as door three and four, and on the back of the hive as door five and six. Um, I know this all sounds like uh, alphabet soup, but uh, uh, once you take a look at it, or if you are 
lucky enough to run into a beekeeper who uses this method, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite elementary. Um, and by the way, uh, my, these slides that I am using, uh, I sent to Eli, and you can always contact her or you can contact me and I'll be glad to send you this, this slide set. Um, it sometimes helps to have uh, more modern visuals, visual aids than the, the basic drawings that Snellgrove provides in his book. So that's the Snellgrove trick. It's a, basically a way of valving the resources that the hive has in bees from where they're not needed to where they are needed. Colony A doesn't need any more bees um, because its brood is decreasing since it doesn't have a queen yet. Colony, colony B in the bottom is rapidly increasing its, its uh, brood cluster and needs all the help it can get. So this is a way of uh, changing these resources not only to support the two colonies, but also to prevent the swarm because without a queen, of course, colony A can't swarm. And uh, colony B has next to no brood and uh, much less food uh, on frames than it originally had. So it is, is not gonna swarm. Uh, and this preventing the swarm is in the end really the trick to getting a reliable honey harvest every season. Whether you do it by a uh, snow grove uh, method, which I encourage, or whether you just split your hives at an opportune time in April or early May, um, <clears throat> you're, you're, you're guaranteeing some kind of reliable honey harvest um, without, <clears throat> because you're preventing the swarm. Once those bees swarm in the spring, there goes the population that will, is, will eventually be responsible for bringing in the blackberry nectar because um, the bees, given the, the amount of time that bees live, the bees that are gonna bring in the blackberry nectar are um, those eggs are laid in late April and early May. And um, we all know that swarms begin to occur here. I mean, there, historically swarms have actually happened in the end of March in very warm years, but it's common for swarms to occur in uh, mid to late April and all through May and on and on and on um, if you don't do something to prevent it. So um, a lot of people that I work with here in my classes or in my consulting um, uh, bemoan the fact that they never get a honey harvest or they don't get very much. And uh, regulating the swarm urge um, or the swarm swarming impulse is the trick to, is, so far as I can see, to getting a reliable honey harvest. Of course, reliable is one thing. How much you get uh, depends on how big a population you can build in your, in your hives and your location, what access to uh, nectar producing forage you have, uh, many factors. But the bees have uh, a chance. If you can get a, a dense, large population of bees from your overwintered hive into the June 1st iteration of that hive when the blackberry is blooming. I don't know when blackberry blackberries bloom in your neck of the woods, but um, it can't be too different from, from what we have here a few miles north. So um, the result of <clears throat> several different um, specified changes in the little snow growth doors over 15 days from the time you start um, results in a new queen. And uh, the queen generally mates from the last set of doors, five and six, 
um, at the back of the hive. Uh, and um, I several recommends that you make a little, some kind of brightly colored landing board. And this is my version of the little landing board. It's just one more uh, navigation aid for a uh, queen um, to help her return from her mating flights. And I have a big bag of these that I've built over the years. And maybe I have a couple dozen and they're as many different colors as possible. So let's, and then like this year, I split nine hives um, in my the, the bee yard that's where I get best results for mating. And I, um, and not only do I, I have different color schemes in the hive, the hive body or the hive stack itself, the different boxes, um, but uh, specifically with the queen landing boards. So very simple, you can see on the right hand side, it's just a plywood, a little strip of wood to screw it to the side of the hive and a couple of sheetrock screws. Um, sheetrock screws are wonderful things to have around. Um, and I, in my, my toolkit, I always carry a, a, a small battery screw gun because uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of things that I do in beekeeping where I'm driving sheetrock screws in and out uh, quickly. Um, a lot better than uh, taking a screwdriver and laboring away at getting a screw in and out. It just um, uh, alarms the bees, but the quick zip zap with the uh, screw gun uh, is over and done with. So here's the final result. Um, when I split hives um, using this method, I'm actually splitting them for sale. Um, I have more bees than I know what to do with. And I, I, I try to keep my, bee, my hive population down to the essential minimum. So every year, um, I, when I use the Snellgrove method to split hives, they end up like this. So originally, um, this, this hive stack here was one brood super in the bottom with the old queen. And she expanded her brood cluster so much that I had to insert a second brood box, the, the green one. And then there's an, a queen excluder and uh, they, with um, the various spring nectar flows, mostly maple and hawthorn. Uh, they filled up not only the original super, but a second one. And then the yellow box at the top is the A colony that uh, was produced by this method of splitting. And now it's been separated from hive stack, put on a bottom board and uh, tops installed, and it's all ready to go. The, I have a ratchet strap on it, so it's just ready to lift off and uh, some some evening I'll screen up that hive and get it ready to transport and the next morning its new owner will show up and we'll throw it in the pickup and they'll be on their merry way. Um, so uh, these this is about late May, May 25th or so and I generally start the snow growth process um, pretty much April 15th. Uh, some years a little bit earlier, uh, one, one of the advantages of using this method that kind of over under splits is that the colony that needs the most heat that's producing a new queen and needs to use all of its energy to feed the queen larvae and forage and nurse and all the things bees do to make new queens, um, they, they don't have to use that energy heating the hive because they're getting heat that's rising right up through the screen from the bottom colony. Um, so this, this colony um, from late May will, in, at least in the Pacific Northwest, will grow on the blackberry uh, flow, nectar flow, 
and I even get now I'm getting at relatively low altitude. Um, I'm getting a fireweed flow that comes right after the blackberries. But at any rate, the blackberry flow is enough in and of itself to help this colony to grow into two um, well populated uh, supers, deep supers of bees. Um, I've even had years when uh, the when the blackberry flow lasts for a while and now with uh, the last couple of years as i mentioned i've had this fireweed flow i've even had the uh, snow grove splits produce a super or a partial super of honey um, although i don't count on that i just what i'm after if i were to keep this this new colony myself is to have it in perfect shape for overwintering um, that in the coming winter, um, and it's uh, it's you got a brand new queen. It's got plenty of space to grow into, so it's unlikely to swarm, and uh, it's uh, also starting in the in the middle of the the um, bee season, so you don't have a huge buildup of mites. To deal with, you do have to treat it as with all hives, um, and we can talk about that uh, later or at another time. Um, so you can you can take it like this, as in the photo, uh, which means taking the increase. You're you're making another hive and either keeping it or selling it, or uh, and then uh, the other option, of course, is to not take the increase and just use the new queen that's produced in the snow grove system to replace the old queen and it's just a simple hive combine where the top box the a colony um, is uh, reversed and put at the bottom of the stack with the, the usual sheet of newspaper um, at, of course after you remove the old queen uh, a day before or so, a day or two days before. Uh, and then you have um, a requeen colony, um, much better odds for overwintering successfully, lower odds for the hive swarming later in the season, and um, any other advantage that you, you might want to cite for having a new queen. And it's a queen that is one more generation uh, towards um, being fully acclimatized to our conditions here. If you're, if you're operating with hives that are bought where the queen comes from some other climate area, um, it's always, um, that's a problem for our long wet winters here. And the more you can acclimate your bees through, through new queens that are that are raised in this area, the better you are, in my humble opinion. Um, so last, not almost the last, no, I think this is the last slide. So that's the snow growth method. Um, I, I hope that I've described it clearly and um, kind of advertised its advantages. One thing that I left out that, that I'll, I'll kind of make my grand finale, is that all this happens in the same little spot of real estate. You don't have to move hives or move um, nukes around. You don't have to have any extra equipment aside from your usual collection of Langstroth boxes. Um, just the little snow growth board, which is a very minor piece of equipment. Um, and it's something you can do if you keep bees in the backyard and you have one or two hives and no room to expand at all. You can split that hive all in the same real estate, replace your queen and go merrily on with the same equipment in the same location. Um, or, you know, you can take the increase and, and gift a hive to your friend or make a fortune selling it. Um, so it's, it's, um, that economy of space is a big plus for beekeepers that don't have acres and acres and acres to spread their bees out in. So um, just 
I, I started off with a little introduction and I'll end with a little bit of a little bit more. Uh, after I'd been keeping bees for uh, I think 10 or 12 years, I was spending a lot of time with other beekeepers sharing what I had learned and learning from them too at the same time. Uh, but jaunting around Whatcom County here, uh, quite a bit, burning up, uh, burning up fuel and tires and maintenance on my cars, and um, and so I finally decided that um, it was I was going broke being a beekeeper, uh, not through my beekeeping, but just through all this travel. So I turned my operations into um, a little consulting firm called Whatcom Bee Help, and uh, hopefully you're seeing that on the screen here. So I have a website, whatcombehealth.com, no spaces between Whatcom B and health. And uh, you can go there and kind of see what I do um, in, between the various pages. I have, uh, speaking of queens, I have a page that's just especially for nukes and queens, nukes produced by the Selgrove method and queens that are produced by the Genter cassette method. Some of you may be familiar with that. Um, it's a way of producing small runs of queens um, using a little cassette, not very much bigger than um, a, a normal CD or DVD cassette, uh, where you are not required to ever touch the queen, unlike grafting, where you're actually physically lifting the larva. Um, and it, you, you from beginning to end, you never have to touch them. And you can do, you can make queens on a very small scale. Grafting is kind of suited to making queens on a very large scale. Um, and the, the, the Genter cassette system uh, is ideally suited for small, small scale. I make, um, depending on my luck, I make um, on average about 30 queens. Which allow in in uh, which are I start in uh, June and the queens are ready uh, about mid July, and so I make enough queens to replace all the old queens in my hives. Very occasionally, if I have a super duper breeder queen that I've produced that I'm uh, enamored of, I I, I might run, run that queen through a second year to get more daughters from her. Um, but all the other hives are requeened, and then whatever's left over, I sell. So, um, you know, 15, 15 or so queens are, are up for grabs for sale um, every, every summer. And I try to time that so that the new queens are available in mid July when you can, you can um, requeen your hive and allow that new queen to populate the hive sufficiently for it to go. Um, through the next winter with pretty good odds of it surviving. Um, that's all I have for my presentation tonight. I hope it, um, we can discuss or um, ask questions. I'm not sure exactly what I have to do. Um, Eli can, can make that happen, I'm sure, uh, if we want to open this up to discussion uh, or questions. I'm all ears. <laughs>